So, well, welcome and good evening. I'm Nigel Hicks, professional photographer based in Devon. And this evening, that being September, we're going to talk about autumn photography, the sorts of things that you might be able to hopefully photograph over the next uh, few months. It's uh, one of the best periods of the year for photography, a lot of photographers' favourite time of year, actually, uh, largely because, of course, because of the autumn colours, but also because of things like mists and fogs and so on. And also um, because it's a uh, uh, the days are getting shorter, so you don't have to get out of bed quite so early in the morning for a dawn and sunrise, and you don't have to stay out quite so late in the evening for a sunset and dusk. So um, it's all a, a, sort of a lot of variety and uh, not quite so painful to actually photograph. So we're going to go through some of the things that, um, that you might be able to photograph in the coming couple of months uh, in this really, hopefully, beautiful season, which has been gorgeous so far, and hopefully it's going to continue long into uh, to up to December. So that's what we're going to cover is from now up till December. And uh, so let's take it away. So obviously the first image uh, is uh, uh, that last image and this image, awesome colours. Obviously this is sort of the most important thing that a lot of photographers are going to aim at uh, during the autumn months, certainly landscape and nature photographers anyway, will be the autumn colours. And photographing just the trees in their final display of the year, and before the before the leaves all fall off, and obviously that exactly when that happens varies from year to year, and from in in different parts of the UK as well. Down here in in Devon, it's usually, um, although it's, as I say, it is variable. It's usually at a peak into the last week of October. Sometimes it runs on into November a bit, but uh, mostly it's sort of. At its peak in the sort of certainly the second half of October, often the last week of October, and uh, really in terms of finding the, the trees that give us the best colours, then really we're looking in terms of uh, trees in our natural forest. We're looking at beech trees, which we have just in this picture. They provide us with the most beautiful copper and golden and yellow colours. Unfortunately, oak trees, which make up the bulk of our natural forests, don't really don't usually turn a very nice colour. Sometimes they go kind of orangey brown but usually it's just a rather dull brown and then they shrivel up and fall off which is uh, not really so photogenic so in terms of what you find in the forest it's mostly beech trees plus also along the fringes of the forest sometimes in you know, high altitude and so on also birch forests and then also the one um, deciduous conifer tree that we have is larch so, so beech birch and larch they, they all form really nice colors if you've got uh, those around you you're really laughing and then in terms of uh, introduce well, also another native species of tree is the field maple which is a small maple tree that produces beautiful golden yellow leaves and you'll find them, them usually at, at a peak during the, into the middle of october you don't find them in the uh, woodlands and forests very much but you do find them planted as as hedges and tree and, and uh, lining roads so uh, if you see um, uh, the trees lining a road going a beautiful bright yellow colour during uh, say the middle of October, it's often down to field maples, so that's, not, that's often the, the case there. And then other trees which are uh, introduced species, I suppose, would be uh, horse chestnut and sweet chestnut, they often produce quite nice colours, and cherry trees often again in the middle of mid to late October. Uh, these are some of the sort of the best trees. And then, of course, um, then there are the sort of North American and Japanese maples, which produce just stunning reds. Unfortunately, we don't have any of those stunning scarlet colours of the leaves in our own in the natural forest. So to see the, the, those beautiful reds, you need to go to parks and gardens where so there's some Japanese or North American maples are, are, are growing, and then you can get some beautiful pictures of those, those reds. Anyway, how to go about photographing them? Well, in this shot, you see, we've, I've, um, sometimes in, when you're in a forest, it's very hard to actually quite literally see the wood for the trees. It's all a bit chaotic, and you're trying to pick out strong um, compositions from this tangled mess, tangled background. And often, as anybody who have come out on my courses will know, I've often will put a river behind my subject in order to try and have a little bit of open space behind it so that we can then really sort of separate the, the subject tree that's in the foreground, separate it from the background by having a river behind it, as we have here. And in this particular shot, as is so often with my images, I come in really quite close and using a wide angle then, so we now get a strong diagonal. This, this group of leaves is producing quite a nice strong triangle just pointing into the picture and the river behind just sets up a nice backdrop, which is, doesn't compete for attention too much. Obviously this area in the background, top right, is, um, 
is a little bit competing, but it's out of focus and doesn't really just distract too much from this area in the middle, really grabbing your attention. So this is what we're all, always after, is sort of simple compositions that really grab your attention, which dominate the frame as always. And another thing about this particular set of leaves you see is it, it's basically a single layer. When you start photographing whole trees, you've got multiple layers of leaves and they just sort of overlap each other and just form this really complex mess and, and a deep complex pile of leaves, even when they're still on the tree. And it often doesn't work as a composition. Occasionally it does, but often it doesn't work as a composition. So if you're photographing leaves still on the tree, which you are most of the time, you want to try and find an area where you've got leaves, where you've got basically a single layer of leaves forming a nice cluster, a nice, nice group like this. And uh, well, I suspect that I've probably shown, shown some of you this picture before because I do wheel it out every, every year because it is one of my autumn colour favourites. And if anybody comes on my Dartmoor in autumn course, you'll, I'll probably end up taking you to this tree because it's one of my favourite spots along this patch of the river where we'll be going, uh, and say, on Dartmoor along the banks of the River Teen. A rather different one kind of shot is something I, I photographed quite a long time ago, actually, is a large forest with the greens of. of uh, a few spruce trees still interspersed among them. This was actually taken in the first week of November uh, in the, the Holden Hills in South Devon. And it's really, you say, well, what's the, what's the subject here? Well, it's kind of the pattern that's the subject rather than any particular, uh, particular tree or part of a tree. Really, for me, this, it's really this pattern in, in this area where you've got the mixture of, of larch and the green spruce setting off against each other, and then shadow areas from the fold in the hillside and it's, it's, so to me that's it's just the whole pack that's coming through this area here that works as, as the main subject that takes your eye and then the backdrop is really just this area of, of gold and yellow falling away to, to the um, spruce the green spruces which are evergreens in the background there and uh, so this so you're not, you're not always necessarily looking at a specific tree or specific set of leaves, sometimes it really is just a path that the whole cluster of trees, in this case, entire forest can create. And this was taken really, as I say, first week of November, just really about 20, 30 minutes before sunset. So the sun is coming really, really low, coming in from the right, just grazing across the top of the hillside. We're getting this shadow on the, on the, on the uh, shadowy side of the hill. Just, uh, and it's really quite a small hill, but the sun is just grazing across the top of giving us a little bit of shadow there and then bright highlights on the, on the side of the hill there and um, this has always been for years been one of my favorites but it was an awesome shot and then we move on into uh sort of parks and gardens this actually is taken in the botanical garden of bath and this is a typical the sort of thing that you're going to find with uh, japanese maples i, I presume actually I presume this is a japanese maple not a north american one uh just obviously set against quite a green background of uh, of British species, still many of them still green, and that this was really at the peak of its beautiful red colour. One of the problems you often have with photographing trees in the autumn is, of course, that um, firstly in a, in a forest, none of the you never get a situation where all the trees are at their peak colour at the same time. You always find some trees are a beautiful golden colour, and others are still green, and others have completely lost their leaves. And then even within one single tree, you'll still have um, areas where the leaves are green, other areas where the, where the leaves are orange or yellow, and other areas where the leaves are completely fallen off. So it's very hard to find a tree where you've got absolutely everything on that tree at its peak autumn golden colour. So here we're really very lucky with this particular Japanese maple where all the leaves are at their peak of red at the same time. And it's just stunning. And then the, behind it, we've got a, a dwarf maple, which is, again, pretty much at its everything is pretty much at its peak at the same time. So we've got this really fiery red, uh, just making this fabulous contrast against, uh, against this green. I often think of this flashback to my childhood, really, uh, tomato ketchup on, on green peas. It's also the same sort of co uh, contrast. It's a bit of a ridiculous comparison, really, I know, but it's, it's this, this great contrast of red against green that I quite like. And they're coming in close again, really close this time, obviously. The, the, first shot I showed you was, was moderately close, but this is really close, just coming in on just a, on a handful of leaves. Again, really just uh, just one single layer of leaves as far as it's possible. We actually a little bit like kind of two layers really, but they're, they're dispersed. And so we're homing in just on this little group of leaves here. We've got another leaf over here, which uh, is sort of 
obviously in a completely different plane. So it's out of focus. It's not really taking your attention. It's a little bit distracting, perhaps, but only marginally. So this area in, in the middle here and lower right is what's in focus. And that this, this area is what, what's taking your attention, which is setting up the composition. And then, of course, the background is completely out of focus. It's really blurred out, so there's no competition in the background. A little bit of red going on in the background to actually serve as a sort of support rather and, and uh, sort of helping with um, setting the mood rather than, rather than a total contrast to the red leaves, but really giving us a nice um, reddish autumnal mood, I think I would say. And moving on from there, it's not just about trees leaves of course although sometimes i get completely absorbed into, into the tree leaves and forget about everything else even dying dead bracken can look pretty good at, in the right light and in the right compositions a bit like seaweed most of the time dead bracken just looks just collapses into some chaotic heap and just is, it's impossible to get a great composition but every now and then you can pick out from the chaos something that really works photogenically and that's what we've got here is just this one single frond which is it, the bracket is dead, but this one single one is still standing up and standing out from the chaos of all the dead bracket in the background. So we've got the background completely blurred, so using a fairly, fairly shallow depth of field to a wide open lens aperture. And we've got this whole frond um, completely sharp and in focus, so it's going across the in front of the lens at 90 degrees for the lens. All those, all those, all the little leaflets are more or less the same distance from. Uh, from the camera as each other and even this curving stem is the same distance so actually the lens after is probably not completely wide open it's not at 4 or 5.6 because it would be almost impossible to get all these leaflets sharp if, if that were the case so it's probably at around about uh, 6.7 or 8 something like that so wide enough open to have the background completely blurred but small enough to actually give us a depth, a depth of field that's big enough to actually have all these leaflets or frondlets, as we should say, uh, completely sharp. And then with a nice bit of sunlight, but not harsh sunlight, but a nice little bit of uh, soft light shining on the, the fronds to give them a nice bit of light, but not so much that you've got bright highlights and deep shadows everywhere. So a nice sort of soft autumnal light. Um, so then we'll move on to something a little bit different, still got some autumnal colours here, these uh, trees and shrubs on the rock face. And we'll just show up this beautiful waterfall. No, no talk landscape for talk, talk about landscape photography, which obviously most of this talk is about landscape photography. No talk about landscape photography for me is complete without at least one waterfall picture. So this is today's contribution for me. This is um, a waterfall called Round Fossil in uh, the west of Iceland. Uh, it was just a stunning, stunningly beautiful place. So I've just picked on one small part of the waterfall and set this white water against the, the uh, orange and red colours of the uh, of, of these shrubs in, in the autumn. So this photographed in uh, mid or late September, uh, just when, the, when the, these leaves are pretty much at their peak. So, so shot is more or less about the waterfall, but I'm really sort of setting the scene with it and the setting the season for the shrubs that, that surround it. So, um, in terms of how it's photographed, again, it's, it's photographed in flat light, no sunlight. If, I, if it was photographed in sunlight, then all this white water here would completely burn out and it would be really quite, uh, quite a mess, really. It would just be burn out quite white and then the rocks would be really, really black in deep shadow. So it would be a difficult picture to actually uh, capture effectively. Obviously, the camera's on the tripod, and I've used a slow exposure, a long exposure time. Uh, I haven't recorded it here for but in the notes, but it's probably about one or two seconds to actually just blur out that moving water. Might be a little less than that, because this water's moving pretty fast, so it might be only a half a second, but round about that half, but somewhere between a half and two seconds to blur out that moving water in that way. And then out on open moorland, this, uh, is on Dartmoor again, and uh, again, this, this is a place I always take people during the Dartmoor and Autumn Photography course at the end of October. Just, it's a, such a spectacular place. It's at the end of October. It can be quite stormy and squally, but that means you get this kind of thing. Lots of wonderful rainbows. The weather changes every few minutes. This is one of the things about um, autumn. That if you don't like the weather, just wait five minutes, and it will be probably even worse. But it might just be exactly the kind of um, 
uh, lights that you want, just changing all the time, especially in, in a wild place like Dartmoor. And this particular shot really is an exercise in how to photograph nothingness, how to photograph a really bleak landscape. Obviously, I'm really helped here by this magnificent uh, rainbow, a complete arc. But the main exercise here is really using just small elements in the landscape. So here, like the single gnarled hawthorn tree set against this water, just if anybody's ever tried to photograph out on the open walls of Dartmoor, it could be pretty hopeless because there's just so little in terms of subject matter to actually form your photographic subject. So you go for every little thing that you can, little hawthorn tree, little expanse of water. And if you're really lucky in autumn, then you have this wonderful rainbow as well to actually cap it all off. So this is the kind of composition that you're really looking for out on those open moors, not just a shot of really featureless blank border, but something which is traumatic like this, with stormy clouds as well, of course, to actually really set the atmosphere and the, the mood of uh, 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 Moorland in the middle of autumn. And something a little bit different, an iconic landscape feature, obviously, it's, it, I think you all would recognise this as Glass of Retour, but photographed in a rather different way from the way that it's usually seen. This photograph from um, a, a marshland nature reserve called Ham Wall is um, to, the, to the west of Glastonbury on the Somerset Levels, which is an area of very low lying ground, only about a metre above sea level, even sort of 10 miles inland as this is. Um, there are in that area, which is west of Glastonbury, there are about, I think it's six marshland nature reserves, which collectively are called the Avalon marshes. And they're just fantastic places to go. And in the winter, they have, they have just teeming with bird wildlife. A lot of migratory like, birds come to spend the winter there. And then you also get these really unusual landscapes, unusual in the sense that people don't usually photograph a glass of retour in this way for, across this marshland. And this, to me, this sort of conjures up visions of what uh, the Somerset levels must have been like maybe a thousand years ago before the marshes were drained. And it was turned into most of it was turned into farmland. Ironically, these marshes have been recreated over the last 30, 40 years as a result of peat extraction. And then the, the great big gaping holes left by the loss of the peat has been allowed to flood, and we've ended up back to back to the ancient marshes again, with, uh, filled with a lot of wildlife. Anyway, photographically, I can see it's a, it's a, a simple, relatively simple shot. The light is coming in from uh, top right. Uh, it's a, it's, it's a little bit sunny, but it's quite filtered by high cloud. And we have just some nice, soft autumnal light coming in on these on the reeds, just lighting them up. The reeds are already all dead, all, all very brown, but with the soft sunlight on them, they, it's really lighting them up and making them a really nice, strong brown color. On a dull, gray, drizzly day, these dead reeds don't re always look quite so so exciting and so so beautiful, but on a day where there's a nice bit of soft sunlight, they could look really stunning. And they're set against this sort of iconic landscape feature, I think it really, it really to me, it really says Somerset and particularly the Somerset levels. We're continuing with the theme of uh, sort of dead brown vegetation, again, Photographing dead vegetation during the late part of the autumn, we're looking at sort of late, late November, early December. It's um, it often is not that inspiring, but if you get some nice light, not necessarily a beautiful blue sky like this, but just some nice light, uh, it can it can really come alive, produce these beautiful oranges and, and yellows and browns, and can be, can be quite dramatic and really very different from something that you would see in summer. So this again, this shot again, it, it's it's on the Somerset levels and it's another of the Avalon marshes. This is, uh, it's called Canada, Canada Water or Canada Lake, Canada Water. I think it's on the Shatbrick Heath Nature Reserve again near Glastonbury. And it's just this stunningly beautiful place. And photographically, it's, photographically, it's a little bit busy. We've got these dead reeds, grasses over on the left here, which perhaps a little bit distracting. But for me, the water, going off into the distance is strong enough to lead the eye away from this chatter on the left here into, into the distance and well partly into the distance but also firstly to these two willow trees and their perfect reflections and that's sort of the photographic subject I think is these two willow trees plus their reflections and then sorry I didn't mean to do that let's go back 
and then your eye is led on past these two village feasts towards the distance. And I find this a very peaceful, restful image. And obviously, taking on one of these beautiful, calm, clear days that you get sort of in uh, late autumn and, and early winter. So we will carry on to the next image now. And it's the same kind of thing. Beautiful sunlight on lots of dead vegetation, producing these really golden brown colours, which you just don't see at any other time of the year. Well, I guess you see them in, in, in throughout winter as well, but certainly not going to see them in summer or the early part of autumn. But so late autumn in, and into the winter, if you've got some nice sunlight, you really see these golden colours come up in the reeds, but also in the trees as well. And it's just get quite a different view from what you see at other times of the year when the vegetation is, 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 is green. Um, on a, this time, it's a breezy day, so we're not getting any reflections of the, of the vegetation in the water, sadly. But, but nevertheless, the water is a beautiful, strong blue, really strong contrast against the vegetation here. And this is just a, sort of photographically, it, you would say, well, what's the main subject? Actually, it's really, to me, the whole scene here. Just the, the water takes your attention, but also the trees and the reeds on the far side. I, I, Ideally, I would probably prefer to have slightly less of the foreground reeds because they just sort of set up a bit of a blank um, foreground, which I know that uh, a lot of you will have heard me chastise people for, for, for not for having a, 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 if you're going to have a foreground, it's going to be a really interesting one. This one is not quite so interesting, except for its really stunning colour, which I think in this instance sort of helps it to get through. One of the other features of autumn and, and into winter is, is early morning mist or mist at any time really, but especially early morning in, in this instance anyway. And um, this can be can set up some really beautiful atmospheric photography. For the most part, or certainly in the southwest of England anyway, you have to be there pretty early because the, um, early in the morning because uh, even nighttime temperatures in the southwest at least don't get down low enough to for the mist to, to stay once the sun is up so once the sun is up in the southwest of england then uh, the mist will burn off very quickly obviously in some other parts of the uk that's likely to, to the mist is likely to last longer because the temperatures are that much lower that the uh, if the sun takes a lot longer to burn off this kind of ground mist it's in, in this particular shot it is quite thin it's already started to lift but it's nevertheless hanging in there in the trees setting up a really quite a nice little atmosphere it's always very difficult to predict because obviously if you're going to get out of bed and drive somewhere to where you think you might get some nice early morning ground mist on a sort of low lying piece of ground, then uh, you don't you really want to be have a reasonable certainty that you might actually get this mist. And it's 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 always a little bit of bit hit and miss. It's a bit like predicting whether you're going to get a good sunset or not. It's um, but so so a rule of thumb for for whether or not you think you might get um, good ground mist the next morning is well, obviously, picking low-lying flat ground, flat ground that's very wet. In this case, it's partially flooded, and you have a day where it's been quite a bit of rain, and then you have a completely still, clear night. So, so the temperature really drops, and it's completely still. So there's no wind to blow blow any moisture away. And if you have really um, a clear sky, low low temperatures, and no absolutely no wind. And the ground is absolutely soaking wet, then you have a reasonable chance of having ground mist in at least certain places. This is actually this is taken in Dorset. It's, it's uh, as you can see, it's a flooded meadow. It's along along the banks of the River Froome. So this is sort of basically the River Froome is burst its banks, and we've got these flooded areas uh, um, in uh, along this meadow, which has enabled us to set up uh, some mist. When, when this shot was taken, you can see the mist is already starting to lift off, but it's, it still shows this really nice atmosphere among the trees. Just a fairly simple shot, just taken with a short telephoto lens, just looking across the meadow into the trees where the mist is, and just, uh, uh, just really trying to capture the mood. If you're a little bit too late and the sun does burn off the mist, as it does in the southwest, then you're, you're left with this kind of thing. Beautiful, beautifully clear. Um, but also hopefully frosty as well. So uh, again, where I am in South Devon, we hardly ever see frost, but if you go to places like Dorset or if you go up onto Dartmoor, um, 
then you will see plenty of frost. Certainly, if you go up to uh, the sum, if you're up around the Somerset levels, or almost any other part of, of uh, the UK, of course, you'll see plenty of frost like this. This one again is photographed in Dorset, the same place as the last shot, taken about 20 minutes after that previous picture when the sun is up, the, the, the mist is completely gone. You would never know there ever was any, and we just have now have this completely open view of the met, of the, the, the riverside meadow. And really, photographically, what I've done is I, I've set up this area of frosty grass in the foreground to, to catch the eye and then lead the eye across the flood to these trees over in the, in the sort of the middle distance over on the right. You might argue quite successfully, I think, that the trees are compositionally a bit too close to the right hand edge of this picture. It might have been better if I moved a bit further off to the left so that I could have shot across this area of frosty grass to the trees with the trees a little bit further into the composition. However, where I'm standing in to take this picture, I'm actually on reasonably dry ground. If I step up, if I stepped a few feet to my left, I was in a very watery ground and I wasn't wearing wellies, wellies which is a, a serious mistake on my part. Um, so I really didn't want to get icy freezing feet, but I wasn't not sacrificing my, my feet with my art, which perhaps uh, is not such a good thing. I should have done that, of course. Anyway, so that's uh, sort of early morning, low lying mist, and then followed by the clear view once that mist is cleared and, you, and you've ended up with sort of a frosty frozen meadow. Then you move on to the hill fog or hill mist and you end up with this kind of thing. This kind of stuff I find very hard to predict. Again, it's going to be down to uh, uh, high moisture levels, not having any wind and so on. It, it, here we've also, you can see we've got actually a lot of cloud above the mist, but, I, but it's, uh, we've got a little bit of an inversion. I think the ground is very cold and the water, the water vapor is just condensed close to the, close to the, the, the ground, even on the hills. And uh, it's just sort of a, a lucky day in the sense that uh, I, I was out driving and I had the camera in the car and just was confronted with these views, that, which I really wasn't expecting to see at all. So this um, is in the Holden Hills in South Devon. Uh, just one of those days that you can pick up in the autumn. Uh, so I think it's uh, most often most mist, low lying mist is early in the morning, but up on the hills, it could be at any time of the day or again, usually early morning again, but it can be in, in all, sort of time, all sorts of times of the day, but it wasn't particularly cold on this occasion. So I'm not quite sure how this mist formed. But here I'm just using a telephoto lens just to pick out basically one, one hillside and create a very simple composition, essentially monochromatic, although it is shot in color, but it is basically a monochromatic image with just, just a very simple uh, view of, of the hillside. And then we move on to uh, river mist or river fog. Of course, again, river fog is often early morning, but it can in autumn and winter go on all the way through the day. This is uh, on the estuary of the River X near Exeter, and it was photographed uh, beginning of December and it's taken at about midday so the fog has really lingered all day and you can see from the reflections that there's absolutely no wind completely still the sun did start to burn through this fog shortly after this picture was taken and the fog did eventually clear but I think that for me this was really I took I did shoot a number of images of different views on the estuary in this morning this is uh, my favorite shot it is just it's simple and it's also quite busy in many ways, just the remains, the ruins of an, of an old uh, key, an old wharf that has just rotted away and we're just left with these few posts plus their reflections and then in the background a, a simpler repetition of this foreground section. So we've got kind of a, an arrow view and just really a simple, simple composition. And it's really, uh, I didn't know I was going to get this when I got there. Uh, it's just something that I just uh, was able to spot and pull out of the, the misty foggy landscape that was around me and of course photographing this is really down to a lot of combination of of features um, just having exactly the right kind of fog at the right time with, the, with absolutely no wind and then with the tide at, at exactly the right height if the tide had been out this this would all around the post would just have been mud so it really wouldn't have looked anything like as attractive as, as this does if the tide had been too high then again you know it might still have worked reasonably well but i might not have been able to get quite so close to these posts as as, uh, as i was able to so it's really a combination of a lot of factors that then just um come, come all coming together to create the ideal conditions and then 
me as the photographer being able to spot the possibility for, for the great composition. And so this is what um, photographers should often be doing is something that is quite mundane that most people really would hardly give a second glance to, spotting something that is potentially rather mundane to most people, but then pulling out of it something really quite special and creating quite a, a fantastic special composition and an image which really tells a story and creates a beautiful, in my mind, a beautiful piece of art. So next shot taken, same place, same time. This is a sort of minimalist wildlife photography. Wildlife photography at its, at its absolute least. Uh, on the same estuary, same fog, same day, you can see that the sun is starting to burn through the fog here. It's got a, a reflection there. And then we just got these two really simple swans and the, and the banks uh, in, in just sort of helping to deli de de uh, delineate the scene, I suppose, and, and give us some context, give us a few uh, pointers and, and uh, landscape marks. And it's just a very simple image. I think you might, uh, some people might argue that the swans are just too small in the scene, but for me, they actually really work quite well. It makes it a really minimalist wildlife kind of shot, which kind of segues me on to the next section, which really is uh, a little bit about wildlife photography in the autumn. Obviously, in terms of mammals, certain mammal, some mammals do go and hibernate, but an awful lot don't, and they can still be photographed. Uh, in terms of birds, then we, um, some birds migrate away, but we get an awful lot of uh, other species that arrive and stay here for the winter, particularly along our, our estuaries and marshlands and so on. And so you can um, really get to photographs a wide range of species that are here only during the autumn and winter months. So here we have a group of curlews photographed in very late afternoon sunlight, shortly before sunset. As you can see the sun is coming in from the right. And uh, Curlews, uh, it's a photograph on the river, estuary of the River Teen in South Devon, close to where I live. And curlews are, are present here and on the River X the whole year round, but in summer only in quite small numbers. In winter, they you really get to see quite a lot, quite large flocks of, of them congregate on the estuary. But they're very, they're a very shy bird, and very difficult to get close to, 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 to close enough to photograph them. So these, this group is photographed from my own personal portable hide, which basically is just a tent without a floor. It's, it's very portable. I can pull it up in a couple of minutes and then move it to, to a spot and set it up very quickly. And uh, it's photographed in a, on, a, on a place in the shore where I know that the uh, as the tide comes up, that the tide drives the birds towards a particular cove. And I set, set up the hide in the cove. And the tide, is, as it's been rising, has pushed these birds towards me. And they have to get a photograph like this. Um, Obviously, you can use it, do the same sort of thing with, with permanent hides, but permanent hides are usually further away from the birds and they're designed more for bird spotters and bird photographers. And so you need to get an awful lot closer to, to these birds to get these photographs than you do to be able to spot them, identify them. So that's a little bit problematic. And that's why I tend to end up using my own personal portable hide for this sort of thing. Um, obviously, photographically, it's, 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 it is shot with quite a, a powerful telephoto lens, 400 millimeter. Uh, with camera on the tr on a tripod in in the hide, late afternoon, the, the composition is really not um, uh, under my control. It's really down to the birds. But hope, uh, hopefully, you'll agree that in this particular shot, they've actually grouped themselves together quite nicely to give us quite a nice composition. And I find this this shot always quite uh, quite satisfying. Then we move on to mammals, and uh, well, the uh, deer, of course, are still around the whole autumn and winter through through. The, through the autumn, of course, we have the deer rut, most especially for red deer, but fallow deer as well. And this is uh, one of the best times to photograph deer, especially red deer, because they're in their finest uh, fur. They've got the finest fur on, and they've got their finest antlers, as tags have anyway. And uh, they are often present in quite large groups, in particular well-known locations. They have their, their rutting grounds, which are pretty much the same from year to year. Uh, and in the southwest, that means Exmoor usually for, for the red deer. So if you know a few spots you can head to on, on, on Exmoor, then you can often get relatively close to uh, red deer to actually get some reasonable shots. This is taken in one particular site I know near Dunster, and, and this is where we'll, we'll be going for the wildlife photography course uh, in the middle of October. If anybody wants to, to join me, that's this is the kind of uh, shot I'm hoping you'll be able to get. It's uh, not guaranteed, of course. 
So this is uh, one of the things that we can achieve. Photographically, composition is not quite right, of course, with this, with this particular one, because these, this pair of deer are actually right bang in the middle of the composition, but I'm not worrying about too much about that because a few seconds later they ran off. So you kind of uh, don't always have time to line up the picture absolutely perfectly. But, um, got uh, some fantastic sunlight on them, perhaps a little bit too bright actually, but it's nevertheless shows them up really beautifully against the vegetation. One of the things that you really see about red deer in the autumn, especially anyway, is that their coats are almost exactly the same color as dead bracken, so they merge with the background so perfectly. Here they're a little bit shown up by the, uh, the green spruces behind them, but the, you, you see that they're almost the same color as the, as the red as the, as the dead bracken and I know from my own personal experience that when these deer sit down in, in the bracken they become almost completely invisible so it's it's quite hard to, to spot them then so um, that's the kind of uh, shot that you'd be looking for for photographing red deer in the, in, during the, the autumn ruts and the rut runs generally through from mid-October to the end of October uh, so it so sort of there sort of second half of October, then you should get to see some good, some good uh, rutting scenes. Here's another shot of red deer, so just a family group of females and, and their kiddies. Uh, just, um, this is actually um, not during the rutting season, it's a few weeks after the rutting season finished, but nevertheless, uh, it, again, in the, in, on, uh, on Exmoor, near, in countryside near Dunster, uh, just um, really nice sort of family, family scene. Technically, this was actually quite a difficult shot because the sunlight is coming in over the top of the hill and all the deer were in shadow. So the sunlight is actually shining straight at the camera. So it was a, quite a difficult shot to pull off. These, this area where the deer are was actually quite dark and it required a little bit of post photography processing to actually light this area up to really bring the deer up. Uh, and without the picture going too grainy, it actually was, took a little bit of work to actually get, get, get these, this image to get the, uh, the deer come up quite nicely. You will also notice that there is only one deer, this one here that is looking at me. These, all these others are looking off to the right of the picture. That's because uh, this was actually taken during one of my photography courses and the, the uh, people that were with me who were lagging uh, some distance behind me were, were making way too much noise, which attracted the attention of, of these deer. And uh, that um, it enabled me to actually come in a little bit closer to the deer because they were watching the other the other people and not me so which, that was just quite handy for me really moving on more mammals but very different kind of mammals marine mammals this is a, a gray seal pup on a beach in cornwall just as it said he was heading across the beach to go into the sea for its first time so i was would, if i'd been arrived about half an hour later i would never have seen this seal and um just I think this is just a great portrait. Obviously, I did stand in front of the seal and block its, its path for a few minutes, but um, at, a, at a reasonable distance, this is taken with a telephoto lens. I'm not as close to the, to the seal as I appear to be. Uh, so I was trying not to uh, disturb its, uh, its, its movement towards the, towards the sea if I could help it. It is um, from September through to December, gray seals drop their pups on beaches around, so around the whole of the UK, not just in the Southwest. Uh, so now is kind of from now on until Christmas really is the time to actually see seals on beaches, certainly I see seal pups on beaches. Uh, and I know that if the, the, the most famous place for seeing this on the main, on the, in mainland UK is a place called Donna Nook in Lincolnshire, or so on the east coast of Britain, where you have really large numbers, hundreds of, of seals uh, giving birth to baby seals. Um, on the beach there, um, I think at a peak, I think the peak is usually sort of late November or so, so that's possibly a good place to head for at that time to actually see quite a large number of uh, grey seal pups and their mothers uh, giving, uh, giving birth. So photographically, just a fairly simple portrait with a telephoto lens, uh, keeping my distance from the seal and not obstructing its progress across the beach uh, any more than I possibly could, uh, could, could get away with. Now back to the landscapes and, and onto the coast. I'm not going to talk, show you much of the coast because I know that my next talk in December is about uh, coastal and seashore photography. So I'm going to concentrate on, on seashore photography then. Now I'm just, just going to show you a couple now. Um, obviously, it's, this is Dirdle Door. And I, I, I'm always, as 
as much as I can, try to get a few shots which are unusual compositions. You see Dirtle Door photograph all the time, and usually photograph pretty much the same angle. And I have those shots too, because those are the sh often the shots that sell, but I nevertheless like to try to shoot views that are a little unusual and uh, make people um, sit up and think a little bit more, perhaps. Uh, so this is a shot is taken at sunset, or just before sunset, really, uh, at the beginning of December. And you can see I've got managed to get the sun actually behind the arch. Uh, and it's partially hidden by the arch, so we've got this wonderful starburst. And this is a, 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 a kind of shot you can only get during the winter months. Obviously, December in December, the sun is setting a long way to the south, or long way to the southwest anyway. You really couldn't do this shot in the summer months because the sun would be setting way over these hills over here behind the cliffs. So it really would not be a, such a, a great sunset view at all. So this is very much an autumn and early winter sort of shot to actually really get the sun setting well to the south so you can get it behind the Dirtle Door Arch. Photographed with uh, a narrow lens aperture, f22, so you can see the image is sharp all the way from the foreground all the way to the distance. And it's giving me a slow shutter speed of about a tenth of a second, so the water is a little bit blurred, so it's really giving me the sense of the, of the waves moving and washing up onto the beach just in front of me. So, of course, the camera is on a tripod using a wide angle lens, but giving uh, with a narrow lens aperture f22, so everything is sharp all the way through the picture and a slow shutter speed, say about a tenth of a second to, to partially blur the water so I can really get the sense of the wave washing up towards the beach and in movements, of course. Something a little bit different, a fast shutter speed this time, uh, and also on a fairly stormy sort of day. In autumn, obviously, the great thing about autumn is that storms are coming up, and this can make this very dramatic photography on the coast. Uh, I would kind of advise against trying to do storm photography at the, at the height of a storm. If you're standing on, one, on top of a cliff at height of a storm, it really is quite dangerous, I know, because I've tried it, and it's really it's, uh, not a great thing to do. Also, the light is really terrible. And, or, and anyway, as soon as you try to point the camera at anything, I guess the lens just gets covered in spray. You spend most of your time trying to clean the salt off, your, off your, the front of your lens. So it really is so generally not a worthwhile exercise. Better to get ahead of the storm and photograph it as, as things are deteriorating when you still might have some sunlight, or as in this instance, after the storm has passed and the clouds have broken, you've got some sunlight, still got some strong winds and some big waves coming in, and then you can get this kind of dramatic shot of these really jagged rocks, which the jaggedness of the rocks really helps us to set the energy and the dynamism of the scene, and waves really crashing across uh, across the rocks to really give, give us a really sense of energy and power of the, of the scene. Obviously silhouetted, backlit by the sun shining in from sort of the top of the picture here, and no detail in the shot at all, apart from the pattern, in the wave ripple patterns on the on the water. This is actually taken on uh, Burr Island off the south coast of Devon uh, on, from the top of one of the cliffs on the south side of, of that island. Now, um, in, as some of you will know, I, will off, I often photograph water blurred when it's moving. And if I photograph it um, with a fast shutter speed to freeze the movement of the water like this, I always do it in such a way that I want to home in on the detail so you can see the, the, the water droplets frozen in midair. Now this one, this shot, is, is I've not homed in anything like as much as I normally would like to, but uh, it nevertheless works quite effectively. This one, however, does fit my usual kind of style of really coming in very close with a good strong telephoto lens, this is with a 400 millimeter lens, and really homing in on a waves, on a wave as it crashes in, in on the rocks in, uh, in West Cornwall. And uh, shortly before sunset, or uh, late afternoon perhaps we should say, uh, in uh, the beginning of December. Uh, so we've got, really got bright sunlight coming in uh, from the right and all this white water. It's, it is actually in danger of burning out. I think it probably has in a few places, but nevertheless, it's, it's really lit up quite nicely. And, and we really caught the sense of drama with the spray and the, and the droplets in, in midair. It's not really much used using taking a wide angle shot with this kind of fast shutter speed because then you're just too far away from the wave to actually see it. The wave becomes very small and the water droplets, you just can't see them in midair. You really need to home in with a telephoto lens. And then uh, my latest image, really more or less, is 
the, the Milky Way, photograph from Land's End, the far end of Cornwall. And the autumn is quite a good time for seeing the Milky Way, provided, of course, you can get to a place where there is really no light pollution. Um, and Land's End is quite a, quite a good place from that point of view. There's very little light pollution there if you're looking out over the Atlantic. And uh, it's the, the Milky Way at this time of year, it rises, uh, well, it can be, can be seen really as soon as it gets dark enough, and it really has to be completely dark. It's, it's not visible straight after sunset or anything like that. You have to wait at least an hour. Off, I think I found for this one, it was an hour and a half after sunset before it was dark enough and you could actually see the Milky Way rising up in the southern sky initially, and then and over the next, next few hours, it slowly moves around towards the southwest. Uh, but you have, have this stunning sky. Uh, it's, this is like um, like the Northern Lights. It's something that you don't see as well with the eye as you do in the final photographs. So this has had quite a bit of processing to actually make the images, uh, make the stars really visible and make them uh, really enhance stars and make the Milky Way stand out as much as possible. It's not it's not falsified in any way. It's just optimized to the absolutely best. Um, best quality of the camera. I may at some point now I finally got my staff with night sky photography sorted, be able to give a talk about the techniques for this at some point in the future. So then uh, talking about uh, Northern Lights, this is obviously again the sort of thing you can see from all the way through the winter really, but starting from the autumn, not really in the UK, although it, uh, in the far north in Scotland you do see it from time to time, more like a, a trip to Scandinavia or to Iceland is what's required. And that's what we have here in the west of Iceland on a really beautiful, beautifully clear evening. Just, um, it's just pure luck whether you get northern lights at all. And if you do, then how strong it is and what sort of pattern it creates. And it does slowly evolve. It does, it's not a static thing. It does move quite slowly. Uh, so it's always changing. You can get lots, a lot of different compositions and different uh, um, images. Again, well, as I said just now, the northern lights usually don't look as good to the eye as they do in the final photographs. Uh, but, but on this particular occasion, it did look pretty good to the eye as well, though perhaps not quite as bright as, as this. The church looks really bright because there is actually a moon shining in the sky behind, in the sky behind me. So it's quite unusual for the, for the northern lights to be so visible when, when there's a moon shining. So usually you need it with, uh, in moonless conditions for it to be really visible and work well. But this was, on this occasion, the, the northern lights are bright enough that they're able to compete with the brightness of the moon quite nicely. And finally, just a quick section, short section on people. I, don't, I do photograph people. It's not just about nature and landscapes. I do do people photography with part of my travel and tourism uh, work. And uh, things that you might see people doing in the autumn, obviously harvesting, is, is one thing, whether it be combine harvesters harvesting wheat or people working by hand harvesting grapes. So we do have you know, increasing numbers of vineyards around the country. And so in October or November, perhaps, you're quite likely to see if you visit a vineyard, you might quite likely to see people picking the grapes uh, if they'll let you come in and, and see that process. It's, it's quite fun to photograph. And then um, festivals. This is the famous um, Bridgewater Carnival which is just, just an astonishing sight. It, it's linked in with uh, Bonfire Night, Guy Fawkes Night. So uh, not all Guy Fawkes Nights, of course, are, are quite as, as spectacular as the one in Bridgewater, but, but I'm sure that uh, it, 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 a lot of them are worth photographing around the country. And obviously fireworks, I haven't put any fireworks pictures in my, this, this display, this show, but I just, but obviously photography of fireworks is a, is a great thing for the autumn. If you're in the Southwest, I can thoroughly recommend heading to Bridgewater Carnival at the beginning of November. It's just spectacular floats, photographing it, um, handheld, of course, because it's a crowded situation. You can't use a tripod. There's huge amounts of light coming off the floats, so you've got plenty, usually quite a lot of um, light to work with. But I always, nevertheless, still use a flash to fire into it to light up the, the, the people that are on the stands. Because if you don't use a flash, they are generally pretty much backlit by the light coming off their own float, and you often don't see their faces. Use a flash. Which is balanced against the light coming from the uh, from the float, and that will light up their faces. And uh, you'll be able to see everything, them and the, and the float as well. And you get these genuinely spec spectacular scenes uh, in, uh, in in this carnival. Another spectacular one in the southwest is uh, ottery tar ottery uh, tar barrels, which again is uh, is tied in with uh, Guy Fawkes Night, but it's, it's burning barrels instead of uh, burning guys. 
Uh, I think I'm pretty sure I've shown this photograph off to people before. So it, it's a very abstract kind of shot, but it's one that really appeals to me because it's a very dramatic image, shows a huge amount of movements and energy and flow, and it also cuts out the, the background shots in the middle of the town, which uh, which is quite nice. It's, for them not to be visible is, is really great. This is taken handheld, of course, because it's a very crowded scene of, of three men carrying this burning tar barrel, would you believe, through the streets of, of Otto St. Mary, through the crowds. Uh, and it's um, no flash fired, so that's why it's blurred. I just got these sparks coming off the barrel, and just, this, just the blur of the men and the barrel as they race by. Uh, just quite, I think it's very atmospheric and very energetic. For those who don't like this kind of thing, the final image shows you a more static shot where the flash is fired. The barrel is moving through this crowd, believe it or not, uh, but it's because the flash is fired, it's actually caught just a moment of time. So it really is a much more static shot. To me, much less dramatic, much less energy filled, but nevertheless one that actually illustrates, in some ways illustrates what the, what the, 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 the scene as it, uh, as it was, shows you. Um, it, a more literal re representation of the, of the scene that was that you can see in Ottery St. Mary. So wherever you are, I'm so sure that you can find festivals going on in the autumn that are really worth photographing if you want to get out into the, into the among the people in the crowds and, uh, and to shoot this kind of, well, not this necessary, this is a particularly exceptional festival, but whatever festivals you have going on in your area. So that kind of summarizes really what I want to talk about. Just the usual last thing. First of all, about the website and for the, all the things that are going on, photo galleries, a lot of new galleries on the website now, uh, plus about my workshops, future talks. The next talk is going to be on the 7th of December about the photography of the seashore and coastline and so on. And uh, the photography workshops, I've got four more this autumn. The 8th of October is garden photography at Rosemore in North Devon. That's pretty well full now, actually. But the other three, uh, wildlife photography on Exmoor on the 15th of October, Dar uh, Exmoor in, in autumn on the 22nd of October and Dartmoor in autumn on the 29th of October. They've all got uh, spaces, so you're really more than welcome to sign up. That would be great. And then, of course, the books. Um, now, there are now five Southwest books, been joined by Beautiful Dorset. Here it is, Beautiful Dorset. -da! It's now available. They're all available, so if you want to have, it, have any, they are all there. Um, just one other thing. Um, um, you know, obviously, for obvious reasons, not run any tours over the last couple of years. I'm thinking about reinstating one or two in 2023 uh, next year. Or, 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 and so just looking at that, uh, possibly an Iceland one, possibly a Cornwall one, if anybody wants to sort of give me an idea of how, how much enthusiasm or otherwise you have for, for, for such a tour, then let me know. And uh, we'll, I'll sort of think about putting it to, to, together. In terms of uh, one day workshops for next year, for 2023, that, that program is coming together uh, and it is um, going to be um, uh, trying to shake things up a little bit next year and so the program will be out on the website in the next uh, week or two hopefully. Anyway so that's it I'm going to unshare my screen and then we can have some uh, questions and answers if you have any if you want to turn your microphones on that would be great if you want to turn your cameras on as well you can do that too but remember that you'll be visible on, in, on the uh, in the recording that will go up on YouTube eventually. Is that Jeff, have you got your hand up? Yes, you have. Do you want to oh, say I've something? I've got my hand up, yes. I don't know whether I know how to lower it again. There we go. <laughs> um, yeah, well, you, you, are, you answered uh, yeah, all this tech. You answered my one of, or two of my questions and one photograph, actually. But uh, I'll sort of ask it just the same again. And that is the aspect ratio. The vast majority of your photographs look to me like they're sort of out of the camera aspect ratio. Uh, but then the one of the deer, the one of the deer, where your uh, your fellow photographers frighten them all away, that one wasn't. And my second question was, how much post processing do you do? And as I say, you, you kind of almost answered two questions in one there. Uh, but do you change your aspect ratio around much, or do you tend to stick with, uh, you know, what you get? Um, yeah, mostly I stick with with the, with the usual format, with the, with the thirty five mil format. If you like to call it that, um, but I do occasionally crop images. Um, but it, um, the most the images I'm most likely to crop are actually wildlife shots. If I think they're actually a little bit too distant, then I will uh, sometimes crop the wildlife images. But most other most other images, uh, I I stick with the camera's format. And in terms of processing, well, all the all the images are shot in RAW, so they have to be processed 
to um, optimize them and to make them look uh, good, but uh, very few of the images get processed beyond just optimizing their appearance. Uh, that shot of, the, of that group of deer did require more processing simply because they were in so much such deep shadow on that on the on the shadow side of the hill, so that did require further processing. But that was only again to optimize the appearance rather than do, do anything drastic to the uh, to the image per se. Okay, thank you. All right, you're welcome. Um, anybody else? No, okay, so um, if uh, nobody else has got anything to say, in that case, I'll, 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 um, I'll end it there and we'll, um, I'll, we'll, we'll say good night. <laughs>